Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, okay, that's my great pleasure to introduce Thomas Petrachek. Uh, I think at least half the room will have met uh, Thomas before, and we'll um, so it doesn't need much introduction. Uh, it's been uh, Thomas first uh, accosted me as a as a, as an undergraduate student, and uh, uh, been working with him ever since. It's been one of the real highlights for me over the last uh, seven years to. Um, sort of see Thomas progress from undergrad in the Czech Republic through his PhD, but also at the same time uh, developing a really high profile uh, presence in the world of um, applied programming languages. And uh, yeah, so over to you, Thomas. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, so I, um, as, as Don mentioned, I have actually recently submitted my PhD thesis, uh, but um, aside from that, I was working over the last few years on, on quite a few things in the F# -sharp community, um, partly using type providers and developing some, some new type providers and applying that idea. Um, and so I was trying to find a common theme for all the different things I've been working for what's in my PhD thesis and what I did outside of that. And I think the term that talks about that describes this, uh, pretty well is context-aware programming languages. So um, why does this matter? Um, well, if we look at what kind of software we're, we're writing today, there's two important aspects. And uh, one of those is that the execution environments where programs run are getting a lot richer. So if your software runs on any device, it has access to the internet, and there's lots of information on the internet. Um, if it runs on your smartphone, there's GPS sensors. Um, if your software runs on the coffee machine, it has some other sensors available that you wouldn't have on the phone. Um, so there's more things, but equally, th there's lots of different environments where your program needs to run. And ideally, I want to be able to write software that I just write once and then it runs on all these different things. Um, like I write a mobile I write an application that runs on my phone, runs on the web, runs on the desktop, and has access to all these different things. Um, so I think the problem of how do we actually use this context that's available, but do it in a safe way and uh, don't sort of do it in a, in a safe way where we don't get into the troubles when one device has different capabilities than another. That's really an important pro problem for programming languages today. Um, so I'll start with a couple of specific examples here. Um, one example is when we're writing today some software that should run on multiple different platforms. Um, say, if you want to write something that will run on Android and Windows Phone, um, there it's actually really hard because there's even not a common environment, but even if I'm writing something for multiple different versions of .NET, um, I have to use some hash if uh, to say, well, if the environment has this capability, then I'm going to run one part of code. Um, and this is the, the preprocessor conditions aren't checked in any way. So that's one thing where we are using really primitive technologies. Um, another case is when I'm writing some database access code using things like link, um, where I write my queries in C sharp or F sharp and then it gets translated to SQL. There's still lots of problems when I'm using some function or method that doesn't have corresponding uh, translation in SQL. So that's again where I'll get runtime error because that's something our current systems don't check. Um, when I'm accessing external data, I'll just say call this URL and assume that there is 
that the response has some format and contains some fields, which is again something that we can't really, don't really check today. And that's really hard to check because we are relying on external sources. Um, another kind of context property is when we're tracking some provenance or <laughs> confidentiality. This is actually where there's lots of interesting and good static, static analyzers for this, but um, we treat it as a special case, as one specific property. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that all of these examples that I was talking about are um, some sort of contextual properties and uh, we should think about them in the same way. So ideally, programming languages should have some notion of context and um, all of these should just be an instance for, for that context and once the programmers understand how, con how they work with contexts, uh, then they should just be able to use all these different, sort of fit all these different specific problems into the general theme. Um, so that's the, the big picture of what I want to talk about. Um, and um, I'll talk about two aspects specifically. Um, and this is sort of, I'll, I'll describe the two, two aspects in terms of programming language theory. So um, this is borrowing, borrowing Don's um, idea that initially, if you look at uh, programming language theory, we start with the assumption that the context is empty. So when type checking an expression, we are assuming that there's nothing in the context. And um, this, is, this is wrong because actually, if you look at programming today, it looks more like this, where in the context that there's all of this world you can access and uh, the pi here is supposed to represent some sort of projection. So the idea is we have this universe and we're projecting bits of it in the, in the uh, context that the application can access. So I'll talk a bit about this later uh, when talking about the type provider work I did and that's implementing a couple of these projections and figuring out how to fit the context into the programming language. So that's one thing. The other thing is we actually don't really just care about projecting this into the environment but the other important part here is the is basically tracking how exactly are we using the context. So if I have, uh, if I'm writing some program, I also need to know which parts of the context my program actually uses. How, is, how, how does it use it? Um, so the idea here, and that's what I did in my PhD thesis, is to add some sort of annotation to the context uh, that describes how the program accesses the context and um, tells us more about um, what we are actually doing. So if you're, if you're looking confused at this point, uh, that's okay, this is just to give you the sort of general theme of there's two different things. One is adding more stuff to the context and the other is understanding the context. And I'll talk about both of these things a bit more and I'll be more precise about what I'm actually saying. So the first part I wanted to talk about is the green stuff and that's tracking how exactly are we using the context. And uh, this is what I did in my PhD thesis and there's two papers about this and it's joint work with Dominic Orchard um, and our supervisor, Alan Mycroft. Um, so the idea here is we want to talk about properties of computations um, and there's lots of well-known work on effect systems. So I'll use the analogy to explain what I mean. Um, now in effect systems, we have some program, some expression, and we are adding annotation that says what the expression does as a side effect aside from evaluating. Um, so this is tracking effects on the environment or it's tracking some sort of output impurity of the expression. 
what it does aside from actually just evaluating. Um, and what coeffects are doing is we are trying to track, uh, so to speak, input impurity or what other things the expression requires from the environment. And uh, just like effect systems can be modeled formally using monads, there is actually a nice formalization here using the dual. So um, using, using common ads, so there is some formal link between the two, but I'll talk, about, talk more about that later. So what would be an example of coeffect? There's uh, basically two categories. One is uh, coeffects that talk about how we are using variables. So if I have a variable, um, I can track whether I'm using it or not, and that's a contextual property. If I have an expression that doesn't use, vari doesn't use variables that are available in the context, that's some sort of annotation I can put on the context to say, this variable is not used. Um, I can track how many times are variables used, um, or um, if I have some sort of programming, data flow programming language where I can say, give me the previous value of an expression. So I could say x plus previous value of x divided by 2 to get some floating average. <coughs> I could track how many past values my expressions are accessing. So these are all talking about variables. The other kind is talking about environments. So if my environment uh, has some sort of resources in it, um, Say in distributing computing, in distributed computing, I can access resources that are available on different nodes. I can track which of the nodes uh, the, the expression is using. So I'll show this using something that everyone understands, lambda calculus. Um, but it's basically simple programming language, and the idea here is this is writing a function that takes x and returns x plus x plus some y that comes from the declaration side of the function. And the first example is tracking how many times we are using which variable. And this is added as these green annotations. So what the annotations are saying in this one is that um, the the expression creates a function that takes int and returns int, and it uses the input, input uh, variable two times because it does x plus x. Um, but it also, we are also tracking uh, information about all the variables that we have in the variable context. So in the variable context, there's y, uh, and I'm using y just once. Yes? Invocations of this returned closure, does each invocation count as one use of y or not? Um, if I have multiple invocations of this closure, then I'm going to, uh, then each invocation is going to count as two uses of the, well, if I say, if this was f and I had f of x plus f of x, then that would count as four uses of x. Uh, two uses of y. Yes. Okay, so we'll see that in the electrical. Because so because um, well we'll we'll see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you so it's not strictly an calculus, I suppose, but if you were not to call this function but simply to seek it then it doesn't oh. evaluate x at all. No, <laughs> sorry, I, I actually, I got it wrong. So what I was saying here is that uh, the way to read this is uh, when I'm defining the function, when I'm actually declaring the function and creating it, it counts as using y. So the idea here is when I'm creating the function, uh, I'm capturing, somehow capturing the, the dependence on the context. So when I create the function, I'm using y, and then when I use the function, I'm not using y again. 
So I can call the function in a context where, um, where uh, y isn't available because y is available on the declaration side. Um, and then when I call it, it uses the, the captured sort of value of y. So I guess this example, um, this example, so the, the calculus here is based on bounded linear logic. And we are actually doing the same thing that Girard is doing in, in bounded linear logic. Um, so there's, there's uh, that as the sort of formal background for it. And um, I'm using it because it lets me demonstrate the different rules in a reasonably simple setting. But I'll, I'll have another example, which is maybe more intuitive later on. So the idea is, and this is really the, the sort of important idea about coeffects, is when I'm creating a function, uh, I'm not capturing all the impurities and delaying them. When I'm creating a function, I can require something from the context, and that requirement sort of happens when I'm creating the function, and then uh, that makes some part of the context available for the function later on. Um, I'll, I'll show the lambda abstraction rule, I think, on the next slide, which will hopefully explain things better. So the idea here is, so in this example, we're, we're tracking some notion of variable usage, and it's equivalent to the bounded linear logic. Um, two important things about the structure of this is that we are actually annotating we're annotating functions with just a single value because function takes just a single input, but we are annotating the context with a vector of annotations because the context has multiple variables in it, and so we need one piece of information for every variable. So in this sense, uh, that's one, one case where it's not equivalent to well-known effect systems because we are actually tracking uh, vectors and scalars rather than just a single sort of set. Um, and there's also a richer structure on, this, on these annotations because we are composing them in multiple different ways. And so we can't get away with just using one operation like set union. We, here we actually need uh, multiplication and, and plus. So how does this look actually in the calculus? Um, when we are accessing a variable, uh, we just mark the, the variable as used once. <coughs> and here's the interesting bit with abstraction, where um, if I have an expression um, that, um, well, I have some expression, and that expression is defined in a context where I have variables gamma and variable x, um, there's corresponding vector of annotations for these variables where R corresponds to the whole gamma and single annotation S corresponds to the single variable. And when I do lambda abstraction, um, I'm splitting this into two, but I know exactly what part of the annotation belongs to the function because um, that's the part that, that belongs to the variable X. And I take that out, put it on the function, but there's, there are still other requirements that are on the, on the context. It's interesting to see x used s times, not r times s times. Um, because after all, when you call the function, it uses its argument s times, right? So the, the, the cross here is supposed to mean uh, vector concatenation. Oh, so the S yeah. applies to the X, and the R applies to the gamma. Thanks, thanks for the question, yeah. So the, the idea is the gamma is used R times, which is a vector corresponding to the variables, and X is used S times, which is what goes on the function. No, thanks for pointing that out. So to actually make this work, um, we need to add uh, structural rules with all that will propagate the annotations carefully when we do something with the variable context. So 
This is showing the, the structural contraction rule where the idea is I have an expression E which can use variables X and Y and I'm replacing X and Y with Z. So now I have variable, uh, now I have an expression e, e and there's Z in places of all the X's and Y's. So I'm joining the two variables. And here again, I'll split the context and find the uh, R and S annotations that correspond to X and Y. And because I'm now using the variable, um, well, th in, the pre in, the, in the assumption, I'm using the variable X R times and Y S times. When I replace both of them with, the, with one variable, I'll be using the new variable R plus S times. So I'm adding the two, adding the two um, context requirements together and turning that into a single element of the vector. Uh, there's a couple of other rules that I need to add uh, for weakening when I'm introducing a variable that's not used and for exchange when I'm just reordering variables because I need to equally reorder the things in my, in my annotation vector. Um, so that's one, that's one case of the co-effect system where I'm talking about variables. Um, right. We're missing the application here. Yes. Um, so I didn't put all of the, all of the rules here. There's, um, they're, they're all in the paper and they're all on my backup slide. Um, is there a multiplication in application? Sorry? Do you multiply numbers in the application? Exactly, yes. So I don't even need the application rule because you already know how it would look. <laughs> but yes, there's, um, there's multiplication in the, in the application rule where um, if I have argument that uses variable twice call and I pass it as an argument to a function that uses the argument three times, I'm modeling uh, call by name evaluation here where that argument will sort of be copied over into every single use and so I need to multiply the number of times the argument is used times the number, um, number of times the things in the argument are used. Like, but you're kind of arguing as if there's some underlying operational intuition about what this use thing means, right? So um, ultimately, you'd expect to have a theorem that says if you know if I have this particular typing annotation, then some operational property holds. Is is that right? Um, what is the operational property, and do, you, do did you you know do you have such a proof? So I didn't have such a proof in in general because um, what I'm trying to do here is to talk about the sort of general structure like I guess I'll, I'll use the analogy with effect systems where if I'm talking about effect systems in general there's some uh, there is some uh, intuition behind effects in, in general for all the different effect systems but when I want to actually talk about concrete operational meaning I have to pick one effect system like writing to memory and talk about the operational meaning in that case. So uh, there's, so what um, I have to basically validate that this is a reasonable system is that uh, the um, beta reduction for the system preserves, uh, preserves typing. So if I, so the way I think about it is there's the general system, which, is, which has two, uh, two formal properties that I think uh, tell you why it's correct. One is that there's a, there's, a formal, there's a semantics for this in terms of commonads, and that's explaining how the system works, and because the annotations in the, in the types match the annotation on the common ad structure, which is well defined, that tells me that it makes sense. And the other part is purely syntactic properties for this, where uh, beta reduction preserves typing, and that's telling me that the system has some good properties. 
Does that make sense in general? But I can't talk, when, I, when I'm focusing on the general system, um, I can't talk about specific operational meaning because that would require focusing on one specific notion of co-effects. Like, I could do that for the bounded variable use here or for um, other examples. Um, so I'll say just a few things about another example, which is uh, tracking how many times, well, so the idea here is we have a language where we have this pref keyword, and the pref keyword lets me access previous value of an expression. So I can say pref of x plus x divided by two. And here, I'm again going to be annotating uh, the context and the functions with a number, but this time the number represents how many past values are we using. Um, and the interesting thing here is that this is using different algebraic structure. Um, so when I'm contracting and I have a variable that is used uh, where I require um, at most five past values for the variable, and I'm also using it in another context where I require at most three past values, then um, I can see this history as sort of list of previous values, and uh, I'm only requiring the maximum here because I'm sharing the values, and I only need last, past, last five values because that also includes last three values. So this is just to motivate uh, the structure, and um, the interesting point here is that there's a couple of different formal systems that other people have done or that uh, we added where the same structure uh, keeps appearing. Um, now the other, the other aspect of co-effects is when we are talking not about specific variables but about um, environment as, the, as a whole. So this is, actually, um, this is actually going to be a Haskell example. So, um, in Haskell, there's this thing called implicit parameters uh, where the idea is um, I can write an expression that accesses some implicit parameters and those have to be provided from the environment, but they're uh, partly dynamically, partly lexically scoped. So if you're, uh, so they either have to come from the call side when I'm calling the function, I have to have a value for these, or they can come from the declaration side. Uh, when I'm declaring the function and these are in the context, I can access them. So there's actually multiple ways to type check this or annotate this, and one is to say split the two requirements. So if I'm declaring the function, so the idea here would be I'm declaring the function on some server where I know the time zone, I can capture the parameter and this is again where I have this notion of capturing when declaring a function. So I can capture the, the value of time zone and I'll end up with a function that requires just the current time. And when I call it, I give it the current time and it runs. Or I can treat this as a function that captures everything in the declaration side. So it treats the two variables as ordinary two implicit parameters as ordinary variables, and I'll end up with a function that doesn't require any implicit parameters. Um, and I'll actually skip this part because I want to talk about another part of the, of the uh, story. Um, so I guess the main technical contribution here is that all these examples that I tried to describe in a bit of informal way with some rules, they actually fit in the same scheme. So that's what uh, I call co-effect calculus. And uh, there's more details in the papers. Uh, given, that, given, the, given the time, I'll probably uh, refer you to that. But the idea is um, we can find some unified algebraic structure and 
the algebraic structure needs to be a bit richer than what people have been using with effect systems because you have the idea of context sharing, uh, which is one thing, and you have the idea of basically application or sequencing where the same context is propagated through the program. So there's a richer structure um, based on semi-ring, and um, there's also a way to sort of unify the two different ideas where we are talking about variables and talking about the context um, using structure that's similar to containers where I can say that the context is some sort of container and I either have things for every single variable or I have one annotation for the whole context. Um, and uh, the sort of one of the theoretical foundations for why this makes sense is that there's a nice commonadic semantics. So uh, if we are modeling effect systems using monads, what we would do is that we say, well, expression is interpreted as some function from the context to a value that has some monadic structure around it. And the monadic structure lets me sequentially compose computations and provides basically the plumbing. Um, we can do the same, things, same thing here using common ads and say, if I have some expression that requires some context, I'll wrap additional structure around the whole, the whole context, the variable context, and then the result will be just a pure function. Yeah. Are you, are you sort of reformulating what had previously been done using monads using comonads? Or are you doing something completely fresh that couldn't be done using monads? Uh, so I'm doing something that can't be done using monads. Um, and there's a couple of previous works that have been done that talk about context in some ways that can fit into this framework that we have. Um, monads treatment of effect systems. So what, what, and, and, and so effect systems are pretty rich, you know, you can put stuff on the types and, yep. you know, rather than maybe the whole, the whole gamma, but, you know, put the information on the type. But what, what sort of specific things can you do in, in that setting, or in your setting, yeah. you couldn't do in an effect yep. setting? So the, the, the key differences are, um, well, there's two different ways, but that's probably for a longer, longer discussion, two different ways of annotating things, like with, with monads, um, I can make the monads sort of first class thing in the language, and then I can wrap every single value in a, in a monadic construct. Uh, but that's doing something else than using monads just to define semantics of a programming language. Where if I'm doing that, then I'm, um, I don't have the, the monadic structure as a first class value in the, in the language. Um, but I guess the main, the best way to illustrate the difference is what I can't do with monads is I can't split the requirements uh, in lambda abstraction. When I have lambda abstraction in, in monadic world, that always says um, delay all the effects and put all the effects on the function arrow. So monads will always sort of delay the whole effect and put it on the arrow. Here, we actually, the, the common ad structure is a bit different, and it provides a way to say some part of the context comes from here, some part of the context has to come from there. So I think that's the key difference. Um, that's, the, that's the key difference between sort of co-effects and effects, is this ability to capture the, the um, delay is the ability to capture something from the current context and combine it with what comes from the uh, execution environment, from the caller. And this is also why uh, you can't model Haskell's implicit parameters in terms of the reader monad, because the reader monad lets you only capture things from the call side, but not from the declaration side. Um, so the, the commonadic semantics is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, and it's not really simple duality between the two because um, in the commonadic uh, 
semantics, we're actually putting the structure around the whole context, and the context is a vector of variables. In the monadic world, we're putting the additional structure only around the single result, and that's just a single value. So because of this asymmetry in, in lambda calculus, where we are mapping multiple variables to a single value, uh, this is actually interesting, and there's a uh, richer structure that's needed than in the monadic effect system world. So um, I think if, if you have any questions about uh, this part of the work, then now is probably a good time to ask, or we can talk more about it later. There's probably lots of questions that um, I haven't really answered here, and maybe it's better to answer them with a whiteboard. Can you give an example of the payoff? Right, so, so you, you, you said, here's a unifying structure. Mm -hmm. So was it helpful to have a unifying structure, apart from you know, maybe it was sort of theoretically satisfying, yeah. but did it lead you to any new insights, or any new systems or mm. analyses yeah. languages. So the question is, did this actually, the, the finding the unified structure, did it lead me to discovering something? And I think the answer is that it did because I sort of started with a couple of systems where um, they all looked different and then um, by trying to find the, the unified structure, I actually discovered that some of my systems were initially wrong because um, they, I only had good intuitive understanding of one, one aspect of the system, but not of something else. And in other systems, I had intuitive understanding of other parts, but not uh, the first it part. You discover that some of your systems were wrong. Did yes. it help you to discover that anybody else's systems were wrong? Uh, so, so it's, it's no, I didn't, outside your head, as it were. I didn't, I didn't discover any uh, other systems were wrong. I think I have a few cases where I think using this would give you better way to understand other people's system. Um, where I think people very often tend to use monads for tracking things um, just because monads are... Uh, generally understood way of tracking things. And then they um, keep adding more structure to them. Well, they start with the monad and they have the monad structure, but then they add lots of other things to the monad and it's not a monad anymore, or it's a monad with other structure. Do you have in your head any quick examples of where you think this would be a better way to understand? So there was, there was actually a, some piece of work on tracking, on doing data flow with monads. Um, and it sort of works, but um, the monadic structure isn't really interesting there, and the, all the interesting things happen in the other operations that you have to add to the monad. And if you do it in the commonadic style, then um, the, the commonad structure captures the more important, more essential part of the problem. So I think that's one example of where this actually helps um, to design better, better languages. Okay, so I think I have um, probably 10 minutes left. So I'll just say one or two things about the other direction or the other area where, where I worked. And that's um, not tr about tracking how we use the context, but it's more about adding other um, making other things available in the context. Um, and I think the nice way to intuitively understand this <coughs> is that um, I think most search engines do this these days. I probably, Bing probably didn't do this when I was taking the screenshot. Um, but when you start searching some, accessing some data on the internet, uh, you get this nice completion where you sort of immediately see what the internet knows about population, and sometimes it even gives you the value immediately. And uh, that's sort of the end user experience, but I kind of want to have the same experience when programming with context in programming languages. Um, and uh, so if I'm accessing data from some data source, I want to have the same sort of experience when I start looking for the data and it immediately tells me what's available. 
So this is building on the top of the work that Don did in F Sharp uh, with type providers. And um, I'll show a couple of um, type provider related pieces of work that I did based on this. So one is the, the World Bank type provider, which many of you have seen before, but it's implementing the idea that was there on the slide where what I can do here is to say worldbank.countries and then it comes with a list of countries and the list is generated uh, live so when I'm accessing the data it actually connects to the World Bank and extracts the, some metadata from the, from the World Bank data source and maps this into the programming language world so I can have a look at Czech Republic and indicators. And then again, here I get access to uh, lots of different indicators, kind of in the same way as when searching for data on the internet. So I can look at some indicator and actually run it to get the value. Um, that's not what you did, that's what type providers do, isn't it? So the World Bank type provider is what I did. Uh, the framework where, where it runs is not what I did. So I didn't do type providers, although I sort of have been contributing to parts of it. Um, and I've written or created many of the type providers that people actually use these days. So this is about um, F sharp data, which is a library I designed, and it's probably the most downloaded F Sharp library on NuGet. Um, so the work I'm talking about here, or my work here is um, designing the library, not creating type providers. Um, and the library, I wanted to mention this on the intro slide, I forgot about it, but it was actually, um, I submitted a paper about this to the ICFP student research competition last year and it won the first place there. So um, if, I didn't, if I wasn't doing interview, I would be working on my ICFP submission uh, this year. So what I did was the sort of design of the, type of the specific type providers, not the mechanism itself. But there's lots of que interesting questions, even if you sort of just look at the design of the type providers, so, so to speak, that's the, the pie in the initial picture, in the initial equation. How do we project from the external world to the, uh, to the programming language type system? And one thing that was interesting in the World Bank case was what is actually data and what's schema? So the World Bank uh, is a massive data source, but the question is which parts of the, of the structure do we want to see in the type system? Do we want to make countries, types, uh, which will make the system break when some country disappears? Um, or do we want to make years, turn the years into types and so on? So how do we actually map from the sort of one blob of data into the two-layer environment of programming languages where we have some types and some values. And the, the World Bank type provider is kind of interesting in that it's really trying to put a lot of things into the types that you wouldn't normally see in the types. So country name is actually a type and that makes it really easy for sort of scripting kind of work, but you probably wouldn't put that in your um, application that's supposed to be running for the next 10 years. Sorry, yes? Can you, can you actually iterate across the countries? I mean, that for, yeah. for a typical data analysis scatter plot across countries, that would seem like a natural yeah. operation. How, no, how does that's, that work that's then a, if there are types? That's a good question. So in the World Bank, it's actually doing two things. It lets you, it turns every country into a named thing, but it also gives you the more value-oriented uh, view where you can just take all countries and they will be all instances of the same type. But that's, that's like one of the interesting design questions here and how do we design the, the type providers so that they let you do all these different uses of the data.
Another part, which is, and this is what was in the ICFP student research uh, competition paper, is if we have some uh, external data source, how do we, and many external data sources these days don't come with explicit schema. When you're calling, say, JSON-based service, it doesn't have schema. The website might give you a couple of examples and say, well, if you call it like this, this is what you'll get back. Um, which isn't a very strong statement, but uh, that's what people have to live with. So this is sort of one interesting specific contribution that I think is sort of um, interesting, not just from the practical perspective, but also from the th theoretical perspective. And this is doing um, type inference for structured data formats uh, like JSON. So I'll, I'll run this piece of code. What this does is that it's just getting data from a service that returns weather. And it gives me back this uh, JSON, which is some sort of structured format with records and collections in it. And uh, if you wanted to read something from there, you would have to look at the sample, uh, find where the actual temperature is, which is under main temp, and read the, read the value there and do some dynamic lookup based on the names of the, of the records. So what I can do with the JSON type provider here is to say, use the JSON type provider and this will look at the sample document and it will infer some type for the document and map this type into F sharp uh, or into the F sharp type system. So when I have a value of this type, I can actually see here all the top level properties of the record that the service returns. So this is looking at the sample data set, inferring some structure from the sample and mapping that into the F sharp type system. And then I can just say w.main.temp and this gives me the temperature. particular place to ask for the weather for. So um, if I wanted to parameterize this function over which date and place. So um, there's okay, one... Principle, of course, the structure of returns might be different, which would... Yeah. You know, so at some level, it's impossible. So, yes, yeah. well, yeah. solving impossible questions is the yeah. most interesting what, what thing. So what this does <laughs> is that there's two things. One is the sample structure, which is what I'm passing to the JSON provider. And then I can here, use load and give it a different URL. And um, so the, the idea is I, can, I have to give it some sample for the type inference. And then I can load different, uh, load different make different requests, load different data. Um, and this will only work if there's some relationship between the, the sample and the actual response. So it relies on the fact that the, your sample has to be representative in some way. Um, and uh, this turns out to work actually really well in practice. Um, there's sort of formal, formal statement for when exactly this work using some sort of subtyping. Um, and there's also sort of practical methods for dealing with this. Like when I find some other data source where it doesn't work, then I have to catch the runtime exception and deal with it. But I can then take that as another sample, add it to my, to my samples. So you can pass in multiple samples. And then you'll see where you have to change your program uh, to deal with this new observation. Yes. Someone hands you a tree and you create a tree. Um, yeah. So is there a noise or, I mean, are these, do they differ? Or do you need to do some kind of generalization from those samples or what's yes. happening here? Yeah. yeah. So the, the technical difficulties here are um, someone gives me a sample and the sample generally could be a record, 
but it could be also a collection of things. So um, there's the, the interesting part is inferring the, the single type for the whole sample from one or multiple different samples. And how to infer type that's actually usable from the programming uh, environment. So if I have multiple records, for example, in my sample, and one is person with name, the other is person with name and age, how do I turn that into one type? I could just create a, a sum type with one or the other, but that would be hard to use. So what we are doing instead here is that we actually turn that into a single record where the age becomes optional in this case. Um, or if you have collections, if you have one sample where you get collection with numbers, well, collection with records and collection with records of different types, which um, you wouldn't believe what kind of things people put in collections in the real world. Um, we, the, the interesting thing is finding the single unified type that captures all the different samples we have. Do you think for, for one sample, there's no technical difference? For multiple samples, there is. is that well, what one sample can also include collections in there. So if I have one sample that includes collection and there's multiple sort of subsamples in the collection, then I have the same problem. So it's actually, it actually, if you like uh, record all the tweets for an hour, then you get a collection of tweets and that's one file, but it includes collections of samples. So the, the unification of samples has to be done not just when you have multiple samples at the top level, but also within, the sa within a single document. Yep. Um, when you talk about this, you talk about kind of, there's these technical concerns about how to make the inference go through, but there's also, you often talk about usability concerns mm. as well. And for instance, it's noticeable that as the type system gets more expressive, like if you can have a type for a specific number, yeah. like the number 7.81 or something, yeah. then you, uh, then, then the system becomes unusable, you know, yes. because you're giving to how. Um, what do you do about usability? Mm. Is I mean, yeah. what, 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 how do you get a measure on like what's usable and not? Yeah, I mean, is it just intuition at this point? Uh, and well, I think it's that's actually one problem I'm kind of interested about because there's um, there's not much we can say about it formally. Um, I guess what, we are, what I was doing here with, with the f -sharp data library <coughs> is just to create it and give it to users and wait for the complaints and see. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, formally, you must be finding some local, but, mi local yeah. minima where, yeah. it's, the, where the, the cost of writing type-related yeah. manipulations is low, but the benefit is high or something. Uh, there's, there's actually like one formal thing I can say about the inference here, which is that the idea is we have to find the common supertype of all the samples. And uh, in this system, in f -sharp, it's much easier to program with records because you can just do dot and see the things there. And um, I have a formal proof for the, for the system here that if there is a common supertype not, that is not a union, then it will find it. So there's one sort of criteria which is using records whenever possible, and the system has that property which is um, sort of formal property that I can say about it based on informal intuition. Okay, I think I should probably wrap up. So um, there's a lot more that I was working on in the sort of applied area, um, including some other data science libraries and so on. Um, so once you have the context, what you can actually do with it. Um, and I think in sort of summary, uh, the idea is there, the, the context is really a lot more important than we, can, than we usually think. Uh, lots of academic work has been done on the E part, like building richer programming languages, and on the Tau part, building richer type systems. Uh, but I think the really interesting thing that I was working on is all on the left. So, um, it's 
some work on projecting from the external world and how can we make that available in programming languages. And that's the F-sharp data work. And how do we actually check how um, the context is used? And I have one slide on sort of talking about the, the future plans, but I'll just say one thing, which is that um, one area I was becoming interested re in, in recently is data journalism. Um, and I think that's really sort of a way where you can put together multiple different of these, of these areas of uh, how do we access data and present it as a sort of newspaper article or some interactive visualization. But it also shows the importance of the, of the tracking because you want to have some credibility or track provenance information. Uh, and when you have an article, you, you need to know where, what the data sources are and where that comes from. So that's one thing we can talk about later on. Thanks. Uh, time for one more question, maybe. Yeah, one more question, I think. Anyone? Yeah, Matt. Can you encode the monadic stuff into the co-monadic stuff? Can I encode the monadic stuff into the co-monadic stuff? Um, well, I think there's like two parts of it. One is the syntactic structure, and the other is the, the semantic structure. Um, so I can't do it on the semantic side. When I have sort of monadic model that can't be captured by a commonad, and when I have commonadic model, I can't turn that into monad. Um, syntactically, I could unify the, the two systems by uh, the, the, if you look at it just syntactically, then the commonadic one has more structure, and I could sort of restrict it in some ways so that it would track set-based um, effect systems. So I could do that, but um, I guess it's more in interesting to look at the actual semantic structure where this wouldn't work. Um, and that really shows the differences between the two. Okay. Um,